OK, so this, uh, this is a dynamics talk of sorts. Um, and there's one point I really want to get across, and that is that I think that this uh, unusual satellite in Enceladus, which is the last one on the slide, in the middle of the E-ring, uh, of which it's the source, is telling us that, uh, that it's young, much younger than the age of the sun, maybe four times younger, something like that, and that all the other satellites of its ilk, in other words, Mimas, Enceladus, and then three more, Tethys, Dione and maybe even Rhea, uh, that they're also young. Uh, and probably the same holds for the satellites of Uranus, uh, maybe all of them. So I'd like to give you why I now have changed my view on this. Um, and. Uh, I'm going to try to do that in two uh, two slides that I made uh, on the plane yesterday when I was coming over, because I didn't realize there was blackboard. Uh, I thought we would be up uh, upstairs, um, and uh, and then I'll show you uh, another piece of evidence which I never believed, uh, but which now I've changed my mind about. Uh, which also suggests that these bodies have come from much closer to Saturn uh, over really fairly recent in geologic uh, time. So that's 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 the main theme. But along the way, I'll tell you a little bit about dynamics uh, because at least that I'm pretty sure is correct, and it's applicable to uh, extrasolar planets. OK, so, um, so what we have here is Saturn. It's rings, not a particularly good rendition of them. Uh, the inner satellites, Pan, Atlas, Prometheus, Pandora, all of which are right around here. And then slightly larger ones, uh, the uh, uh, co-orbital satellites, Janus and Epimetheus, and then Mimas and Enceladus, and then it cuts off. And, and Enceladus has been known since the Voyager days to, to be in the midst of a ring of micro-sized, micron-sized particles, uh, which we now know are ice, actually salty ice, uh, in some cases, which are coming out of uh, Enceladus. Um, so I'll introduce you to the observations. I'm not going to spend a very <coughs> long time uh, on these. Uh, and then, um, so here's some of the evidence. Uh, this, is, this is Enceladus, an in, in outline. It's a, a modest size satellite. It's, it's 250 kilometers in radius, uh, about 10 to the 23 grams. And it's losing about two times 10 to the fifth grams per second of material. Most of this material uh, is in the form of water vapor. And it's escaping from the, uh, from the satellite. Uh, it's escaping because at the temperature at which it originates, which uh, is probably close at least to the uh, freezing temperature of, of water, uh, the sublimation uh, pressure, the equilibrium uh, vapor pressure, and uh, molecular speed is, is such that uh, uh, it, the, the, uh, the um, thermal speed exceeds the escape speed from uh, Enceladus. So it's just flying out, although it looks like it's accelerated a bit from coming out of vents. And we'll see those in a minute. And then mixed in maybe 10% by mass uh, with this uh, vapor, uh, small ice uh, particles, again, micron size. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft has flown through the uh, plume, collected and analyzed the composition of uh, both the 
vapor and the particles. And some of the particles, particularly those that are bigger and closer to the bottom of the, these uh, geysers, are quite rich in salt, up to sort of a few percent of seawater. And so this indicates that they probably are in contact or were in contact. The water was in contact with some rock uh, and was leaching out uh, salt. And so it makes Enceladus a good target for searching for life, uh, at least in the eyes of those who study Enceladus. Uh, I think it's a little silly right now. But, uh, but anyway, you could fly through it, which is a lot easier than uh, sampling than you can do on any of the other bodies that seem to have water other than Mars. OK, so that's, um, that's that. And then, and then this is uh, another view. Of course, what you're seeing is the particles backlit. So you're seeing the diffraction peak uh, scattering of the particles, which is one of the ways you can really sample the size of the particles from the width of the diffraction peak. And so you're always seeing these on the limb. Uh, OK, now if you, look, uh, if you look at the uh, surface of Enceladus, this was already recognized in the Voyager days. There are these four big cracks near the South Pole. They're really right at the South Pole. The South Pole's right in the middle. Um, they're uh, sort of half, uh, well, uh, somewhat more than half a radius. Uh, length, so they're radian uh, or more uh, in length. They're very narrow, and the highest uh, resolution images, the cracks are no more than a few meters wide. So this, oh, 30 uh, kilometers or so. Uh, yeah, and that's an, a clue to how deep they probably are, things that crack that are over water, ice that cracks over water is probably uh, yeah. yeah. Along the cracks, but not not uniformly, either in time or uh, in position. Um, yeah. So this was it was already recognized. It was a very beautiful paper um, uh, by Steve Squires and others uh, after the Voyager. Uh, flybys of Saturn, uh, saying that, that this is probably, this satellite is probably the source of the E-ring particles. It probably stuff has come out of it fairly recently. Uh, that the absence of craters in the South Pole region as opposed to the farther north region is probably due to active resurfacing. And even suggesting that it would be hard to understand the thermal activity uh, with tides uh, for many reasons, one of which is that this body uh, is, uh, um, has very low orbital eccentricity, only 0 0.0047. And another body, the one that I showed on the first slide, Mimas, which is closer to Saturn, it's only a little bit smaller, has four times larger orbital eccentricity. Uh, and doesn't show any of this activity. So some people refer to this as the Mimas set. Any explanation for the thermal activity of Enceladus in terms of tides uh, has to explain why you don't see this uh, uh, from Mimas. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, these are all co-rotated. The time scale for tidal be spinning is, is negligible. It's probably a solar system age. Uh, Excuse me? Well, the craters going up are more typical of the icy surfaces of these, these satellites. And this one just has it all covered up. So what's special? Oh, and by the way, this, this body is the brightest, highest albedo visible body in the solar system. It's geometrical albedo. That is the albedo that you measure in reflected light if you're standing in front of the sun, which pretty much the Earth is. Uh, 
is almost 100 percent. It's 99 percent, I think. Yeah, it's covered with some sort of uh, snow. Or yeah. Yeah, the only thing I would say there is that <coughs> this is sort of a comment after Scott's question is that this is probably <coughs> some indication of the depth of the water below the surface. And, and I'm not going to talk uh, at any length about the gravity of this body, but, but, we, but uh, from a few close flybys of the Cassini spacecraft and the excellent tracking they do of it, the second and even one of the third harmonics of the gravitational field has been determined. And from that and various massaging done by geophysicists of, ver of models of compensated uh, uh, topography, um, uh, they estimate that there's an ocean underneath the southern hemisphere at a depth of about 30 kilometers. Uh, the, the surface is low here. Uh, and the gravity uh, is high, uh, which is an indication that there's some denser uh, region under underneath. Um, it's a very crude uh, estimate, though. OK. OK, so those stripes are called the tiger stripes. and. Uh, they glow, as you can see in this next uh, uh, slide. So there's also a thermal imaging spectrometer on, on uh, Cassini. And it found, very, very shortly after it looked at Enceladus, that the temperature along these cracks, uh, there's the South Pole right in the middle of the Bull's Eye, uh, is much higher than elsewhere. The, the sort of typical temperature on the surface, of course, depending on season, uh, is of order 70 degrees or so. But in these cracks, temperature probably goes up at the surface to something like 200 uh, uh, degrees. And by the way, that temperature is high enough uh, uh, s for the equilibrium vapor pressure to account for the sublimation supplying the plume. So, so something in heat is getting up very close to the surface. Uh, OK, one other thing you ought to realize uh, is that water ice has a density uh, about 7% lower at, at zero pressure, which is consistent with everything inside uh, Enceladus uh, uh, than liquid water. Uh, so, so if there is water and it's not under pressure, it wouldn't rise to the surface. It would rise 7% below the thickness of this ice. So it would be kilometers uh, down. So I'll come back to a little bit of that. OK, now, uh, everybody pretty much nowadays thinks that the thermal activity is due to tides that Saturn raises in Enceladus uh, and which vary in time because Enceladus is moving on this very slightly eccentric orbit. Eccentricity about 5, 10 to the minus 3. Um, so that, that, that's, uh, that's believed. But just in case you don't believe it, and there were pe some people who didn't initially, uh, there's this beautiful demonstration that the plume activity uh, peaks near the apoapse, near the farthest distance uh, that Enceladus gets uh, uh, from Saturn. Uh, and this is some corrected uh, uh, measure of the plume activity. This is the orbital phase. This is periapse. And you see that there's a rise. This is work uh, that was led by Matt Hedman 
of it was at Cornell, but now I think it was in Idaho. I don't know why he couldn't get a better job than that. Uh, beats me. He, he was for a while in Princeton, I believe. He, Bradford, maybe. Yeah, he was an undergrad at Caltech. And he's, he's the best person I've met in analyzing this data. And for some reason, uh, he didn't get it. It's just, it's just, it's just uh, this little f here. You, you had studied uh, celestial mechanics. You would know this little f is the true anomaly, and the true anomaly is zero at periapse. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Ah, well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, there is an answer to that question, uh, a partial answer. And that is that if you neglected the cracks and you thought that you had a thin shell over a global ocean, then the cracks would be under tension at apoapse and compression at periapse. Uh, but that's only. It's only a partial answer because the hydrostatic pressure of the ice at the depth that the cracks go down to is much, much greater than the tidal stress, the maximum tidal stress. So how the tidal stress, I'll, I'll explain that, I think, how the tidal stress manages to pull things apart when the stress is much smaller than the hydrostatic pressure, which is an interesting one. Uh, it's related to how deep earthquakes in the Earth operate, because for any significant depth in Earth, the hydrostatic overpressure is much greater than the stress drop in, in terrestrial earthquakes. So as yet, unsolved problem. Yes, but a very weak one. There's a very strong Earth correlation with lunar earthquakes, or moonquakes. Moonquakes, yeah. You, you know, I'm not going to answer all these because I don't know the answer. Alpha, what's alpha? Alpha degrees. read that part of it. I don't know. Uh, this, this may have something to do with, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it may have something to do with which orbit. I, I, I don't know. They're stretching like an accordion. Oh, oh what, what makes the surface temperature? Oh, that's just the sun. 70 degrees at the surface is the sun. Yeah, but very small. Uh, yeah. OK, so, so now, now, now we're going to do dynamics. I uh, want to be really careful so I get to my main point, especially since I know this is a very aggressive audience. Uh, but since I was here, and I know how to handle aggressive <laughs> postdocs. Although Scott told me there's a postdoc here that's even more aggressive than Boaz. Uh, so I've been gearing up. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so I want to say a, a, a word about the dynamics. Uh, not much, because it's a whole subject in itself. But the, the, there's a resonant argument, a single argument which is important in this resonance. This is a two to one resonance. The orbital period of Enceladus is about half that of the satellite Dione with which it's in resonance. And the argument, the important argument, is this one up on top, uh, phi, two lambda prime minus lambda minus omega. Lambda prime is the mean longitude relative to some inertial uh, 
axis of uh, <coughs> Dione in its orbit. Lambda is the mean longitude of Enceladus in its orbit. And Pomega there is the longitude measured from the same inertial line of the, uh, of the periaxe of, uh, of Enceladus. Now there's another resonant, near resonant argument, uh, phi prime, which involves the periapse longitude of Dione. But it's not important in this subject because Saturn is sufficiently oblate that the precession rate of this periapse and precession rate of Enceladus periapse differ by so much that the two resonances don't, don't overlap with each other. Okay, and then the rate of change of this resonant argument, if there were no resonance involved, would be just given by twice the mean motion, the mean orbital angular velocity, 2 pi over the period of Dione minus that of Enceladus minus the precession rate due to the oblateness of Saturn and the uh, other satellites, but not the resonant term. Uh, of, of uh, Enceladus. Now the simplest uh, consequence of these resonances is that you have a set of nested periodic eccentric orbits with a perturbed body. In this case, Enceladus. Enceladus is about 10 times less massive than Dione. And uh, it's the one that's getting a perturbation in its orbit. And these eccentricities increase with uh, proximity uh, to the resonance. So when 2n prime minus n uh, gets near 0, the eccentricity is bigger. There's a little bit of poetic license in these equations, but not much. Uh, just enough so that uh, uh, they don't look uh, ugly. Okay. So we have one resonant argument, and that's going to turn out to be of some significance. Uh, this resonant argument, oh, by the way, this is all the work I did in my thesis uh, in 1962, and I'm still standing. Uh, um, finally got published in 1965. I'm not quite sure why it took so long, but anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to find it. OK, oh, yeah, mu prime. Mu prime is the ratio of the mass of Dione to the mass of Saturn. And it's uh, almost 2 times 10 to the minus 6. But in that poetic license, I left out a factor of 0.76. So you can think of mu prime as uh, 10 to the minus 6. And any in resonance or, or uh, in, in stuck, caught in resonance, uh, this uh, angle phi librates as opposed to circulates. So it's like a pendulum vibrating. I don't think I have one here. So phi librates, but it's a little bit more complicated pendulum because its length changes as it vibrates. Not very much, but a little bit. And uh, so some of these terms indicate that. But in addition, remember this eccentricity got bigger as you got closer to exact resonance. So you can see when you're very far away from resonance, this term dominates the frequency of small vibration. When you get close to resonance and the eccentricity grows, this term dominates. And there's a minimum. frequency, which is where these two terms approximately cross over in strength. And that, that's a very interesting place where there's a change in topology of the phase space. OK. Now this system, oh, everything here is being treated two-dimensionally. So it's all in a plane. We're only studying a planar problem. Uh, and in a. In an interaction between a satellite on a circular orbit, 
which is the way Dione is being treated, and one on any other orbit, which is the way Enceladus is uh, being approximated. There's only one constant of the motion, which is the Jacobi constant. The difference between the energy, we treat the lighter body as a test particle. It's orbital energy per unit mass minus the angular frequency of the perturber times the angular momentum per unit mass of the test particle. But there are two constants of motion in this case because there's an ignorable coordinate. In the dynamics, only lambda plus omega appears, not lambda minus omega. And for those of you who remember the Routhian from uh, uh, actually one middle-aged person, right? Uh, from the classical mechanics, you'll know that then there's a conserved quantity. And this is it. And because this corresponds to motion in a rotating coordinate system, is actually a time dependent derivative of phi. Uh, and then there's the equivalent of the Jacobi constant, not exactly the Jacobi constant, because this is coming from some approximate set of equations, but it generates a conserved quantity here. So, so we have these two conserved quantities, and I'll, I'll talk about them a little, just a little. Okay, so now the next, uh, I hope this works. Uh, am I cursed? Okay, so this just shows the dynamics. A black uh, curve is a circle. This is Enceladus. This is Dione, and this just shows what happens in a two to one resonance. I made this, this is my first computer presentation. When I came here, I was asked to give a talk. And I made this, it was much harder than, than it is now. And everything here is active, including the line between Saturn and the periapsis of the orbit. And you'll see this thing is trying to regress but very, very slowly under the resonance uh, dynamics. So it looks like it's about to break. And so after Enceladus has gone around twice, it catches up to Dione. And these conjunctions occur always at the same place in inertial space. And that's what makes these resonances uh, so strong. So that's what the uh, being at the very um, exact resonance looks like, but you can perturb around it. And I'm going to just show you another picture also made from that same long time ago. Oh, there we go. So this is just, this is now taken in the frame in which Dione is fixed. Here's Enceladus. Here's what I mean about this pendulum uh, changing length of time. It's, see, it, it's asymmetric depending upon whether the swing is this way or that way. Uh, and so this eccentricity changes on the two directions. Anyway, that's a libration. Okay, can people see that? That's, uh, okay, so now I'm going to show a little bit of the phase space. I'm just going to run through this. So, so the way to think about this phase space is for every value of that little k, the one that came from the ignorable coordinate, you have a whole bunch of level curves or a constant Hamiltonian curves. H is really a Hamiltonian of a system in which the canonical momentum and coordinates are the eccentricity squared and phi. You have all these level curves. And here are some of the level curves for a particular value of k, which is less than some critical value, k crit. And k crit is, is 2 times the uh, cube root 
uh, new prime of uh, three. Uh, that ten to the minus uh, two, uh, because new prime is ten to the minus six, uh, and this is where the topology is very very simple. There's only one maximum in the Hamiltonian. All perturbations away from this maximum energy correspond to a stable libration like this. Sort of bounded, and that's all there is. If you take a cross section at that value of k through this contour diagram up, then you get a hill that just keeps increasing. But there's a change in curvature here. Flexion point. Mean point is up here. Okay, so uh, so this is somewhat farther from resonance. Uh, uh, this is actually where Enceladus is, is now. It's a value of k like this, where the only thing you can do is make small librations around the maximum or big librations, um, and it's making very small ones. This angle phi is only changing by a degree or so, less than a degree. Okay, but if we Enceladus, no, it's not a rigid body, but it's almost a rigid body. Yeah, it's about as rigid as we are. Yeah, yeah. we're still pretty rigid for your age, right? Yeah. Enceladus is older. Okay, so if you go to a larger value of k, to k bigger than this critical value at which this topology changes, then the level curve, the Hamiltonian change, you have two stable equilibria. One's a maxima, that's this one. The other one is a minimum here. And then there's a saddle point over here. So now the behavior can be more interesting. You can have a libration around the maximum. You can have a libration around the minimum. You can think of these as being like circulations of the atmosphere on the rotating Earth or rotating planet about a pressure maximum, perfectly OK, pressure high, or circulations around the pressure minimum going the opposite direction. Okay, now it turns out, th 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 this takes a while to get used to, it turns out that this minimum, which is always to the left of this line, corresponds to have passage through the resonance, escape through a resonance. And it also turns out that once we put in the effects of tides, which break the Hamiltonian nature of the dynamics, these pressure maxima are overstable. So if you start with a body with a pressure maxima, the amplitude increases, increases, the libration gets into bigger and bigger libration curves, eventually gets onto the separatrix here, which separates these two regions, penetrates into this inner boundary of the separatrix, spirals around, and ends up there. And, and this, uh, this I think, was first really understood by Hilke Schlichting, who's an assistant professor at MIT, and me uh, about a year and a half ago. And, and this, we propose, is the reason why so few exoplanets are found in mean motion resonances. Uh, we thought this was pretty clever, uh, but the community doesn't seem to have understood it. Uh, it's their loss, in my opinion, not ours, although Hilke seems to be quite uh, upset by it. Uh, but in the end, you know, science always gets it right. Uh, so you just have to wait and see beyond. Okay, so, so this is just a little bit of dynamics, and it's a, a warning that what I'm going to say about Enceladus 
requires that it avoid this fate of getting stuck around this uh, maximum when k is bigger than k crit, because I'm going to say it does get much bigger than k crit, and therefore just escaping through the redness. Okay, so that's that's the end of the simple uh, dynamics. Okay, so 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 now I, I'm uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about what the effects of tides have in modifying k little k and modifying h. It still isn't quite. Where I'm trying to go, so I have to. Eh, I'll probably make it. So, okay. So here we have uh, the rate of change of k. Ch k changes for two reasons. First, there are tides raised by Saturn, which are driving both uh, um, Enceladus and Deimos. I mean, in uh, Dione, away from uh, Saturn. So they're making their mean motions, their periods, get longer, their mean motions get smaller. And, and I, I define here tau sub n minus 1 over n the NVP, and tau sub e is minus 1 over e the EVP. And then their tides raised in Enceladus, which tend to damp its eccentricity, and that's the source of its heat although the amount of heat that it's getting right now is probably really negligible. OK, so that's how we go along in K. And then we have the effect on the H uh, from the tides. One part of it is just coming from the KDP, and then the rest of it is coming from the damping of the eccentricity. And that's what causes this overstable behavior when k is bigger than uh, k crit. Oh my goodness. Yes. That's so good. You're more awake than I was on the airplane, or maybe uh, it's easier to see this than it was to see my laptop with the person in front of me in my lap. Uh, yeah, I should have invested in uh, the economy plus seat. I found other little mistakes, but I didn't notice that one. OK. OK, so uh, uh, this I already told you. There's an equilibrium if phi equals 0. Um, but I haven't told you about this EE. Uh, so. This is something I actually missed in my thesis. I had two uh, uh, papers on tides, one in which I described the uh, uh, resonance, what, why there were so many resonances in the satellite system, and the other one in which I described how eccentricity uh, would be damped faster than uh, um, semi-major axis would increase. satellite system so that this might account for why the orbits were so round. Although I don't really believe that's the reason anymore. I think it's more just formation. But, um, but I missed the fact that as k increased, the eccentricity grew, the eccentricity damping would become uh, produce more heat. And ultimately, this would cause the semi-major axis to decrease at the same rate that the, uh, uh, that the tides raised uh, in Saturn by the satellite would cause the semi-major axis uh, to increase. And there would be an equilibrium, and an equilibrium eccentricity. And to my knowledge, the first people who understood this uh, were Doug Lynn, who's sitting over there, may have forgotten that he did this, uh, with uh, John Papaloisi. Uh, they then went on to say they didn't believe my tidal hypothesis, which was wrong. But uh, I mean, 
despair of that some mistake, but but um, but they certainly got this. In May of this was the same year that uh, Io's volcanoes were claimed uh, uh, by Peel, Casson, and Reynolds, and it may be they understood it too, although. I, I never saw that clearly in, in their work. OK, I already talked about this separatrix and change in topology. So now I want to tell you, uh, show you the sort of more full description of what's going on here. If we look at the rate of change, oh, here I got them up in the right place. Thanks. If we look at 1 over m prime, the m prime dt minus 1 over m dn dt, which is the rate, if you want to think of it, is convergence towards resonance, uh, any resonance, uh, uh, far away from uh, resonance where these eccentricities are small compared to both E eek and E crit. This is just 1 over tau n minus 1 over tau n prime. But when you put in the resonance effects, which aren't included in the definition of these tau n, tau n prime. There are two corrections. First, you can get to a maximum eccentricity, which is E eek, and then you stop. And this is E eek. Or with a small amount of poetic license, it's E eek. Uh, or you can get farther if E eek is very large, you can get past E crit, but the going gets slower and slower. And the reason is that once you're in once once the body is in resonance, the inner body starts transferring angular momentum and energy to the outer body. It transfers them in the right ratio so that the outer body's orbit stays circular. And that means that it gives away relatively more, um, <coughs> relatively more uh, um, energy than it gives, relatively more angular momentum than it gives away energy because there's higher en angular momentum over energy for the outer body than the inner one. And therefore, the inner body becomes more and more eccentric. So, uh, so that accounts for the bottom part. OK, so now, now this is my two slides. OK, so now this, this is the evidence, at least my evidence, or the reason you could say why I think the satellites are young now, uh, um, based on uh, some simple arguments which go back to this E eek. So first let's consider the thermal diffusion across this ice, this ice shell. What's the time scale of thermal diffusion? So here we're talking about a model because we don't really know how thick the ice shell is. Uh, but if you take the mean density of Enceladus, which is a bit above 1.6 grams per centimeter cube, uh, and you assume that it's made in cells that has a rocky core and an icy shell, then the icy shell would be somewhat thinner, actually, than this, a bit thinner. But I've taken it as thick as possible to make this diffusion of heat away uh, as slow as possible. And the diffusion rate through ice, through consolidated ice, and through just almost every insulator, solid coherent insulator is about 10 to the minus 2 centimeters squared per second. This diffusion rate is the thermal conductivity divided by rho times the specific heat per unit of uh, unit mass. And if you then take 75 kilometers and this diffusion rate, you find that the diffusion time is 5.6 times 10 to the 15 seconds, or somewhat less in 200 million years. Not very long by the age of uh, the solar system or Saturn. Is, 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 
Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, but but I'm going to tell you that the, all the heat's put in in the shell. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, this is the diffusion time. Now, to melt, you have to raise the temperature to the melting temperature of ice, 273 degrees, and the surface is on mean about 70 degrees, 73 degrees maybe. So about 200 degrees. And so that requires a heat input when you look up the specific heat of uh, rock, uh, metal mixture, chondritic material, and ice of about 1.8 times 10 to the 32 ergs. And it has to be put in fast enough so it doesn't leak out. So in less than 200 million years. And, and actually, uh, for those of you that remember a little bit of your condensed matter, you'll know that this product, rho times the specific heat T in a mass, is much more constant from one type of insulator to another uh, than CT itself, because it depends upon the number of nuclei, 3 kT per nucleus for the thermal energy. You have to worry a little bit about the by uh, temperature if the material is really cold. Um, so, and then in this estimate, I also include the fact that since the heat's being put in the shell, the shell's not all going to be raised to 200 degrees because the surface uh, is going to stay at 70 degrees. The, the amount of heat that's coming out of Enceladus, except in the crack, and this is all pre-crack. Uh, doesn't raise the surface temperature by anything, by some few thousandths of a degree Fahrenheit. So, so we have to get this amount of energy in uh, in this time scale, and that corresponds to a heat input delta H over T diffusion. Now, of course, what I'm doing here is summarizing the results of solutions of the diffusion equation of heat. Uh, numerical solutions, but there's nothing more in them than what you put into them, except it's nice to see the computer make a nice graph. Okay, and that's three times 10 to the 16 ergs per second. And it turns out that if you put in three times 10 to the 16 ergs per second, right at the base of the ice shell, to use the conductivity of ice, you can maintain the base of the ice shell at exactly 273 degrees uh, indefinitely. You have to put in 3 times 10 to the 16 ergs per second, 3 gigawatts. Uh, uh, that's actually not a negligible amount of energy, by the way. <coughs> no, it, it can't be measured. It can't be measured. Oh, I was going to say something about that. Uh, what's coming out, of course, there's a big incentive to make a lowball estimate of what's coming out because nobody wants to think that this is uh, inexplicable. Uh, measurements have ranged between 5 gigawatts and 17 gigawatts coming out. That's coming out the crack. It's coming out now. It's not coming out through general conductivity. It's coming out because warm water is coming up the crack. I'm talking about the situation before there are any cracks, just trying to heat the system up. Uh, so I'm doing something that really is meant to be average over a much longer time than the time we've observed in Sullivan. Uh, but yes, what's coming out is, is more than this now. Oh, this is three three gigawatts. So what's coming out is between five and fifteen, depending on seventeen. Yeah, well, that was my view too. Uh, that's why I think this is a better argument, but that I'm going through now. But okay, so so this value applies if all the heat is input at the boundary between the core and shell. This you can all work out analytically. It just takes a couple minutes. 
Okay, but but we calculate, and by we now I mean me and my uh, kind student, uh, uh, Jing Luan. We calculate the profile of the stored elastic energy in a tidally deformed body consisting of a shell of ice in this thickness and a rigid core of rock. The ice is much less rigid, much harder to, much easier to deform than rock and ice. It's, it's more than an order of magnitude uh, uh, less rigid. So all the stretching occurs in the shell. And we calculate the heat, the, the uh, stored elastic energy. It is concentrated towards the base of the shell. But it's not a delta function at the base of the shell. And if you use that profile, you find that you have to, just to maintain steady state, a temperature of uh, 273 degrees, you have to add about 5.5 gigawatts uh, of energy to melt. Okay, so now, now I'm going to show you that this really causes a problem with the age of Enceladus. This is the last. Okay, so now one more equation. We can calculate the power that's dissipated in Enceladus when it has an eccentricity, an orbital eccentricity E. And that's equal to the, if you want to think of it that way, it's epicyclic energy, the energy associated with the deviation of its orbit from being circular. So this is twice the orbital energy if E were one, and then this accounts for the eccentricity divided by this parameter tau E. And the maximum we can make this E, or E squared, is if we push as close to the resonance as we can get, where E rises to this equilibrium value. This is the value I wrote down before, a couple of slides oh. back. And if we put this into that, the tau E's cancel out, which is a good thing, because we don't really know what tau E is. So then we get the maximum power to be this. But if we assume that the dissipation in Saturn over a factor of two doesn't vary very much, the tidal dissipation, then we can relate tau n prime to tau n. And tau n prime then would be two tau n. So then we get this relation, the P max is equal to this. And then since we know that P max has to be greater than this value, we can solve for tau n. And tau n, I actually made a mistake here when I tried to cover it up, but I'm not good enough with PowerPoint. This should be a 17, not a 16. So tau n then has to be less than 8.7 giga years. And you may say, oh, well, this is not a very good argument because the solar system is only 4.6 giga years old. But given a tau n of 8.7 giga years, you can ask how long in the past would Enceladus have been close to Saturn? And the answer is two giga years. And that's because the tidal evolution rate depends very sensibly, slows down a lot as you go farther away from the planet. And so you have to multiply this number, not that one, this one, uh, by 213, uh, by 313, and then you get two giga years. And even this, 
even this is an overestimate for the time at which um, Enceladus goes much closer to Saturn. Because it assumes that it's been in the same resonance with uh, Dione for that whole time. It also is based on taking this, uh, uh <coughs> it's also based on uh, taking the shell thickness to be greater than almost certainly likely to be, which makes the diffusion time longer. Uh, what? Oh, well. Uh, not, not now. It isn't now, of course, because... No, it isn't, actually. No. It used to be thought by Harold Jeffries a very, very, very long time ago. Uh, yeah, but it isn't. Um, it's not uniform. No, no, that's true. Okay, so so that's um, that's my argument. Basically, my argument. Uh, okay, now let me say a couple more words. First, how am I doing for time? Am I? Oh, I'm already getting over, huh? Okay. Uh, there, there, there are two other really interesting questions here. Uh, one is, why is all this activity at the South Pole of Enceladus? After all, I haven't said anything about that. Uh, but we've done work on that, quite a lot of work on that. And when we solve the uh, tidal equation, we find that the stored elastic energy, if there's no ocean, which at some stage there might not have been, the stored elastic energy is not at the poles, but is at the sub-Saturn point and diametrically opposite the sub-Saturn point. And the amount of stored elastic energy integrated over the thickness of the shell at these points is about three times, almost exactly three times larger than it is at the poles. And so these are the places you would expect the first melting to occur if you started with a cold uh, satellite. But once you have a thin ocean, if you have a thin global ocean, then the boundary condition at the core changes from being one in which there's no motion to being one in which there's no radial motion but free horizontal motion. And then the stored elastic energy is all uh, at the poles by a factor of 4.3. So I think that's why um, I think that's why the poles are singled out, but not why one pole is singled out. Okay, and then okay, and then if you ask why is one pole singled out? Well, once you have an ocean, the shell is no longer constrained by being stuck to the core, and since it's much more um, stretchable, has a much lower elast elastic modulus, shear modulus, really. Uh, it can stretch a lot more, and the stored elastic energy jumps by a factor of 25. So all of a sudden, when you start to form this ocean, there's a big increase in the stored elastic energy, and presumably then in the rate at, swing at which it's being dissipated. And you get a runaway melting. In a very, very short time, the whole body melts. It, it melts so fast that the eccentricity, the orbital eccentricity, doesn't decrease very much until it melts almost to the surface. Okay, and in that case, uh, since it's a runaway, it's unstable. If, if the one, one pole gets a little ahead of the other, other pole, uh, it, it reaches the surface first, and then the eccentricity damps, and, and that's what you see. Okay, now, I don't expect you to believe this, because I never believed it for a minute uh, until recently. So after a lot of work, we were left with this problem of what did it all mean. And then I remembered this paper, which I also didn't believe. 
This is a paper based on astrometry by a young fellow in Paris named Laney, who, who wrote one first on Jupiter, on tides in Jupiter, and then did this uh, uh, same work on Saturn. So what he did is he took 120 years of observations of the sat Saturn satellites, astrometric observations. These are very difficult uh, observations. He also, with his colleagues, constructed a computer program putting in all the known effects. And he, and he, he made a calculation from the data of the rate at which all of these satellite orbits were changing over the last 120 years. And he found that they were all expanding except for Mimas, which were shrinking. That's one of the reasons I never believed this. Uh, but they were all expanding, and they were expanding at a consistent rate, again, except for Mimas. And if he, uh, he calculated that rate, it was 10 times faster than it had been uh, expected uh, based on the idea that the satellites were as old as the uh, uh, age of the solar system. And so, and, 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 and this problem was greatest for the satellites, the inner satellites than the outer ones. So the, he, he got a K2 over Q here, which is the measure of the tidal expansion rates due to Saturn, uh, which was about 10 times higher than the value estimated from theoretical arguments. Let's go back to me, really, uh, to my thesis again, where I said, oh, the, I said that you could only understand the resonances uh, if two things were possible. First, the expansion rates were no faster than a certain amount. Uh, because otherwise the satellites would have been farther from the planet than you saw saw them or found them, assuming that they were as old as the solar system. And second, that the expansion rates had to have been significant because all of these inner satellites, the inner four, were in resonance. And so they had to have moved in order to have found resonances to enter into. Um, and he says, no, no. This estimate was 10 times too small. OK, now I believe him. OK, so you can believe me or not. In the end, science always gets it right. Uh, it may take another century of observations before I doubt it. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see. OK, so that's basically it.